seawall. Uh, the numbers are rising dramatically uh, as we speak. So there's a lot of people out there uh, from all around Australia and overseas too, which I'm, I'm really interested in. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from Wajak Noongar land here in uh, WA. Um, and uh, pay my respects to uh, uh, the elders in any area that we're uh, working from today or, or at home from today. Um, so the purpose of this is going to be a, um, a really quick fire kind of overview of outcomes measurement and evaluation in one hour, which will include uh, two uh, chat um, times. So we're going to fit in a lot in one hour. Hopefully you'll be uh, nice and relaxing, but also uh, um, exciting as well. As exciting as we can make outcomes measurement and evaluation. For me, it is very exciting. So I hope you find it uh, like that too. So what I'll be doing is um, sharing a PowerPoint for a period of time. I'll be just checking in around the chat. Uh, so as you're um, picking up on something, if you want a particular question addressed, let me know. If you want to make some comments, just put them in. I'll try and pick them up. Um, and I'll try and pick up a couple of the questions. And if uh, you're asked to come on and, and uh, give that question to the whole group, uh, just unmute yourself, show your video and say who you are, where you're from, and we'll um, have a little chat about that. So there's gonna be two chat sessions. So now what I'll do is um, hopefully share a screen. And uh, I hope this works. I'm not terribly adept at this kind of thing, but we'll see how we go. And we'll just do a few uh, uh, PowerPoint slides and then I'll go to Q&A. Good, all right, let me uh, start away. Um, and uh, I'll now share the screen, hopefully. Um, and uh, we'll see how we go. Um, so hopefully everyone is seeing that. I'm sure you'll let me know if not. Um, so this is about uh, uh, impact measurement, uh, outcomes measurement, um, and uh, just about um, um, measurement and evaluation in a particular context. And that context is for purpose activity. And we're the Center for Social Impact, so it's for social impact purpose activity designed to address needs in the community undertaken by any type of organization. So you can be a business, you can be a social enterprise, you can be a charity, you can be government, whatever you are, you can be an individual, you can be a community group. The context that I am looking at is uh, a context around for purpose activity. The reason why you're interested in measurement uh, and evaluation is to measure and understand and assess. That's when we start talking evaluation, not just measurement, but assess and understand the difference uh, that you're making. Um, and that's the, the context. Now, before we get into actual direct outcomes measurement, very important that whatever you're doing you are understanding the needs that you're trying to address. So that means you need to know your environment and you need a needs assessment. Um, who is being affected? How are they being affected? Um, understand the different groups, diversity involved. Um, not all groups are the same in terms of uh, the nature of the program or activity that you're going to be engaged in. Then you're understanding the activity and, and remember that um, you can have an activity which you're trying to get outcomes for, or you can go the other way. You can have, what are the outcomes I'm trying to achieve? It might be, for example, uh, reducing um, the, the impact of long-term unemployment um, or any unemployment in the current environment, uh, reducing anxiety. Um, and then you might go backwards and backtrack and then see what would be the best activity to achieve your outcome in the end. Um, and in doing that, um, I think that you're doing a number of things. You're looking at the evidence base. Um, there is a method for doing that, which I suggest you have a look at, which is a systematic review process in which you set out on a very um, strict path to uh, say these are the types of 
uh, reports or papers that you're going to look through. This is the kind of methodology that I expect uh, that would be in there to see what the evidence base says about that activity. But in this kind of process, don't just rely on um, the evidence base that is in the literature. Draw from lived experience and stakeholders um, through various mechanisms, but a social design mechanism. In particular, we journey map. Uh, but you must get that lived experience voice so that you've got a grounded activity. Um, and then, of course, you need to know your organisation. You have to understand the resources that you have available to you. For example, you have to understand the governance strategy, uh, governance factors. Um, so all of these things are important uh, when we actually go into measurement. Um, and then, of course, we get into measurement itself. Um, so you've got an, a, a, a particular activity in which you're trying to achieve uh, particular outcomes and goals. And um, in doing that, you're going to what uh, we describe as write a logic model, uh, which sets out how your activities uh, are going to achieve the outcomes uh, that you're seeking. And in that sense, yeah. there is a theory of change that lies underneath that. And I really do think it's not just about a simple diagram, but it is deeply drawing on your evidence base and drawing on your journey mapping social design uh, to understand the chain of linkage. That's why it's called theory of change. So I do think, I, I sort of use the logic model word, uh, phrasing for, you know, the diagrams, etc. but underneath that, uh, use the terminology theory of change to understand the linkages between your activities and the outcomes and between outcomes to final goals. Then in planning, of course, um, you try and operationalize those outcomes. Um, and here we get into language which differs between different uh, people, but uh, you know what kind of measures you're going to use and the indicators. Then you need to collect data, um, you need to have a method, and uh, we then link into evaluation because before you start, you really should have your research design and your evaluation strategy in place about what kind of data you're collecting, particularly around collecting data prior to your activity starting and post your activity ending for individuals. Ethics is critical, um, can't uh, underline that enough. Um, and this all needs to be done. Your measurement uh, and evaluation needs to be done with stakeholders engaged right from the, the beginning and developing a good impact culture within your organization. Um, and that's a, big, that's a bit of an issue. Um, not all people see uh, measurement as a fundamental. A lot of people say, well, we should be devoting all our resources to uh, service delivery. Communication and learning, very fundamental. Um, we've done a bit of research on this and uh, the level of uh, comprehensive public reporting on outcomes uh, is lower than what we would expect. So uh, the delivery of outcome statements, of impact statements in a public arena is certainly amongst four purpose organizations uh, less than what we see in the financial area. So financial statements, financial reporting, necessary, required, regulated, uh, impact reporting, not so much. Um, now, as I said, the program logic is fundamental, systematic way to present your understanding of the relationships among the resources you have to operate your program, the activities you plan, and the change you hope to achieve. And by thinking through the linkages and writing out the framework, the theory behind that, you understand those linkages better. Hence, I do like saying both program logic and theory of change in there. And in terms of that program logic, here's a, a simple kind of presentation of the elements of the program logic without lots of nice lines indicating relationships. The outcomes 
really should go back to uh, the lived experience voice, the consumer voice on the outcomes they themselves wish to achieve, as well as, of course, what you get through a professional, uh, professionally defined uh, environment as well. So I can't emphasize this enough that you basically need to do this uh, mapping and engagement from the beginning to know that the outcomes that you are looking to measure and the evaluation you're undertaking is grounded, is grounded in the lived experience. Um, now, so, and I, and I said we were going to do this in an hour, and I'm serious, we are going to do this in an hour. So, um, next stage to this, of course, is you've written an outcomes uh, um, kind of mapping. Um, you understand the relationship between your activities and outcomes. Then what you want to do, and this takes resources, it takes a lot of resources actually, um, is to write out what we call an outcomes measurement framework, which links the, um, what you've done in terms of your program logic to um, indicators, measures, targets, and to data sources. Um, and uh, that's then all about the operationalization of your program logic. And the typical outcomes measurement framework will have a statement on the outcomes framework, what we call a data dictionary, which lays out in detail um, how on earth you measure particular things. You know, what are the, the different instruments you use? Where's the, your data source? How, in fact, you define the numerator and the denominator so that anyone who comes along knows what you are talking about. And typically, it comes with a dashboard, um, which presents your key results. Um, and that's the kind of thing that uh, you take along to board meetings and say, this is how we're going. Um, this is an example that um, uh, we've been involved in. Uh, so the West Australian Alliance to End Homelessness, which the CSI is engaged with here in Western Australia, uh, wrote a strategy document a few years ago, very important in influencing uh, the state government around its strategy on homelessness. Uh, it had very clear targets and goals, and then we wrote a outcomes measurement and evaluation framework surrounding that. I do hope your eyes are perfect and you can read every single word that I've got here in figure two and, and so on, um, but you can't. But it is, in fact, just a, a conceptual framework uh, around um, what we're doing um, and the data dictionary, I've just taken one uh, page of the hundreds of pages of that. I am not sure that anyone has ever read it back to front uh, or front to back. Um, but each page on that data dictionary says uh, for any particular um, indicator, um, uh, measure how we are getting the results, where we're getting the data from, how we're defining it. And the dashboard, as you can see here, presents some results. Uh, we have very strong targets um, and uh, we will see um, how West Australia goes um, uh, going forward in terms of achieving those targets. Um, so uh, that's an outcomes measurement framework that sets out um, different elements, the outcomes framework, the data dictionary, dashboard, and so on. Let's talk just very quickly about the measures you should uh, be looking at. Um, first of all, uh, validity and reliability. You know, do, do the, um, the data items uh, arise from, say, instruments or questions, which on the face of it um, are meaningful, uh, cover the content that you wanted to cover, uh, um, correlate well with related kinds of measures, uh, don't correlate well with um, things that it shouldn't be correlating with, and that you see some uh, reliability in terms of getting consistent results over repeated testing. Um, we should also be looking at Australian norms and reference points. Um, 
but being well suited to the target population. Now at this point, um, I just wanted to say that in, the, in a real world setting, um, it is not possible to throw in every kind of valid, reliable scale that you've ever thought of. It just does not work. It's, it's too big a job. You cannot do it and you have to adapt to the environment. Um, but that does not mean cutting up existing measures. It doesn't mean just on the top of, you know, just, just thinking up a question, just throwing it in. Um, invariably, when you cut things up and just throw something in, uh, the, it's disaster um, because you've got nothing to compare with. Uh, you, you, you have people who say, well, what does this question mean? I don't understand what the meaning of this is. Um, be very, very careful about this. Um, it's better to have a short kind of survey uh, than um, that is good than um, a messy uh, middle length survey, if you like. Uh, culturally appropriate and relevant. Um, and you have to know whether your staff uh, can really administer it or whether you need outside support lots of different sources and make sure you go to those different sources to look for measures. Nothing worse than seeing questions on say, uh, you know, employment or unemployment, which are outside the labor force framework, which has been developed by uh, institutions like the ABS over a long period of time. Um, don't do it. You can go and get uh, it, just about anything you want from existing sources. Um, in terms of measurement and the data itself, um, I'm very um, interested in, in doing mixed methods approaches. This is not just about quantitative data. Uh, In-depth interviews um, are really, really valuable, very valuable uh, in terms of understanding um, uh, people's um, awareness um, and perceptions and their own uh, understanding of their situation and getting at things that you didn't put into a survey, uh, really getting at causal factors a lot better, uh, allow those interviews to be uh, semi-structured um, or less than semi-structured uh, if you're doing quantitative surveys so that the interviews really bring out the voice of people. Uh, so this is very, very important um, to have the, the combination. Um, and obviously, quantitative data, gather unit record data. By that, I mean that you're asking individuals questions and you're keeping your data in terms of those individuals over time. And if you do things well or do have the resources for it, probably is a better way of saying it, to get information prior to someone starting, during and after is ideal. Um, there's the administrative data you collect. Um, administrative data is the, you know, when did this person start the program? How many uh, sessions of a particular program did they have, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the data that you as an organization collect. And of course, in the current world, uh, there is that uh, potential from a research point of view, of course, we're doing it, but the linkage of your data to government administrative data sets is definitely where things are going, not only for research, which has uh, happened for some time, but more generally. Um, so just to illustrate uh, the benefits, um, and we're going to go to uh, the first Q&A in a second. So get ready for any questions and discussion comments now throw them into the chat area because um, we're just about to have our first Q&A element. Uh, one of the pieces that we published um, some time ago was uh, something called the health, the state of homelessness in Australia's cities, a health and social cost too high, in which we analysed data from um, a particular survey that was conducted with um, those rough sleeping in the main. And uh, the, um, the nature of this was that there was a survey uh, in which we collected quantitative data. So for example, time spent homeless came from a couple of questions in what was called the VI Spad app. Notice there uh, in terms of uh, duration, um, how you've got uh, short durations occurring. 
Um, uh, and then you have a group with very, very, very long durations. Um, so that's quantitative data. But what was really interesting to us was there was a question, which was, uh, what do you need to be safe and well? And we actually um, analyzed that across 4,000 responses and did some coding on it. Um, and uh, what, was, what was interesting was how well um, uh, you can see, I think, in this, Maslow's hierarchy of needs came in. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's important to be able to go through that um, and um, recognize what it was that um, those uh, participants were saying was important for them. And uh, this, this gives a profile of the type of things that are important. But when we did the analysis of, you know, um, home or housing was really significant. Uh, safety was very significant. Employment was very significant. Um, and so on. And social friendships was fundamental. Um, so what does that say? It says um, these are the outcomes. These are the outcomes that we really need to pay attention to. If, for example, uh, we are working with rough sleepers and they're not uh, delivering employment opportunities and paid work, that's going against the outcomes that are being specified. So let's be very careful about that. Um, uh, when we do our measurement, uh, well, we will develop our program logic and we do our measurement evaluation. So uh, now what I'll do is stop share, uh, hopefully be able to get back to it pretty easily and um, basically say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, we'll take some questions um, so let's just, first of all, um, get something, uh, uh, Chris, Chris Lee, uh, emphasizing causes. Um, then we might go to uh, Stefiana uh, and uh, Min. Um, and uh, so let's go first to um, uh, Chris. Is Chris there? And can Chris unmute, say? Hi, yes, I'm here, Paul. Chris, how are you? Yeah. Good, thanks. Enjoyed what you've been saying. Great. So what's the, what's the, it was more a comment, wasn't it? Well, it, it, you, you sort of started the chain of understanding from needs into activities, yeah. I guess, out, outputs, outcomes, etc. cetera. Um, I'm just wondering what you've um, seen in the past about the importance of really understanding the cause of the problem. I mean, maybe you, you mentioned homelessness, you can solve the homeless one, the physical problem if you like, but you've got to think about the causes. And similarly with lots of social problems that people encounter, be it attendance at school for young kids, the problem, yeah. the cause is probably that may well be the parents. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm talking mean, about your experience there. Yeah, I think that's fundamental because the, uh, the program logic um, uh, and theory of change should actually be encompassing those, those causal factors in their specification, absolutely. Uh, when we wrote the um, West Australia, I mean, this was a, a highly structural thing for a systems level um, framework. Uh, we were looking at the causes of homelessness, for example, when we wrote our framework. So you can see in the framework and the dashboard and so on, um, uh, the use of these terms, structural causes. So. For example, in that systems level framework, we were looking at you know, housing as a structural factor, but also other structural factors. Um, and uh, that also was linked to, if you like, a life course kind of thinking around homelessness as well. Um, so for example, the, the evidence is, uh, say half of all of those who are adults became homeless first in childhood, teenage years, if you don't look at that pathway, you're not going to address homelessness because you're, you're losing those, that 50% already um, of adults, for example. Fantastic, good. Okay, so um, the, the next one, um, uh, Stefania, um, I'm sure I've got that wrong, but is, is Stefania? You got it right. <laughs> it is Stefania. <laughs> 
Um, so I, this is more to do with the actual um, data collection. Um, yeah. I just wondered, so with qualitative data and doing those interviews, for example, with the interviews, um, what would some of the common pitfalls be, um, for example, in terms of the, the answers that people give and, and whether they actually fit in with what you're at, actually asking? And then my second question was around, in terms of quantitative data, um, often we can get um, honed in on percentages or the, the mm -hmm. exact number of, of people that did something um, instead of looking at the context behind it. So um, how much context is needed to make that data accurate in, in what it's actually trying to tell us? Yeah, there's, there's no question that the two together work extremely well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, for example, um, we'll be putting out reports very soon um, on a program in Melbourne, the Journey to Social Inclusion program. And um, in that, we have a pretty, a very heavy quantitative component, which involves a longitudinal survey um, and it involved linked administrative data and, and so on uh, that give outcomes in a whole range of areas. Um, but it doesn't, the data itself doesn't explain particular things. So it doesn't explain uh, particularly well why certain things occurred. Um, it doesn't give, it gives some quantitative background around, around history. Um, so the history of homelessness, for example, you can ask quantitatively, but the actual journey that someone followed, um, you know, for, for example, th this was a journey to social inclusion uh, from a rough sleeping in the main into housing. Uh, what was the actual journey into um, housing like? Were there pitfalls along the way? Um, uh, and right now, for example, with, with COVID-19, um, it's really interesting to get insights from people um, around the uh, issues that they have. So for example, you can ask quantitatively um, whether you've um, received less or more service delivery and then what areas, but what did that mean for you? So with uh, a reduction in face-to-face -face service delivery in um, drug and alcohol areas or in, in um, uh, mental health support um, or in even medication, uh, what did that absence of face-to-face -face support mean you know, for you as you went through this um, experience? Uh, and that you can get from a qualitative kind of response. So my argument would be we definitely need to bring um, uh, qualitative and quantitative measurement together um, and uh, in that um, to have very open interviews which are uh, coded, um, work through that, that's heavy resources. It's huge heavy resources in terms of qualitative work. Um, and it's huge heavy resources in terms of doing a longitudinal survey and, and all the rest of it. Um, so we have to be careful that we don't, you know, uh, push people to the very limit because uh, many services um, uh, may have uh, um, dollars for support that would be perhaps even less than, you know, the ideal measurement and evaluation program, which of course is ridiculous. So it's got to be, uh, we've got to be careful about that. Um, yeah, so um, uh, perhaps we can just get to one last comment before we move on from uh, Nin. Um, and um, uh, is Nin there um, at the moment? Yes, I am. Great. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I was, yeah, I, I frequently come across the... Um, uh, trying to, like, on a very practical level, integrate a sort of like a programmatic evaluation approach where you're sort of looking at a before and after intervention with um, very pragmatically when a lot of organisations these days are trying to continuously prove and have a culture yeah. of continuous improvement. Um, so I was wondering if you have any, um, if you've observed or if you've practised any good ways to integrate both of them or if you had any comments on, you know, we just, it's better to um, 
preference a more of a before and after one so that you get more accurate results rather than trying to push for continuous improvement or vice versa. Well, it's very interesting because that's a good segue into the next uh, little section on evaluation because um, you, you do have these approaches in which, uh, you know, say this is what's called a gold standard in health, um, you know, randomized control trial, a lack of intervention and engagement by the people measuring and the people evaluating with the program itself, uh, keeping results back um, because that will distort um, you know, the, uh, the, the measurement, you have that kind of approach. Um, uh, but against that, uh, what I would suggest looking at um, is what's called developmental evaluation. Uh, an older style um, was a bit more like action research kind of stuff um, in which you are deliberately going out and presenting results as you're going along and saying, um, whilst this muddies the waters in terms of pure evaluation of the program, we've actually built that into our design. Uh, I think it's useful when you do that to do it deliberately and be very careful about that to say, right, we are uh, undertaking um, what's called a developmental evaluation approach and you are quite deliberate about it. You write it out so that everyone's aware that that is the approach that you're adopting. Um, and, uh, but of course there is, um, you know, that clash with, if you like, the standard kind of approaches from the past, including what I've done, you know, say doing a randomized control trial in which you're not delivering differential outcomes to the program as it's going on and a more uh, engaged style, um, but be deliberate about it. Read the, uh, work on developmental evaluation um and engage with it and take it on so that you have a framework there ready that can guide you through a process of continual change in uh the program as your results are coming through recognizing that there can be problems with that kind of approach Okay, so now let's go back into uh, talking about which uh, another 10 minutes on evaluation. Um, and I might say that so doing everything in one hour is um, difficult, um, but you've got so many opportunities to follow this through, um, as we will say at the end. Um, but let's just try share screen again. Um, and uh, let's hope I've got it. Uh, back to where I want to be and I'm successful in this task uh, of moving on which um, I think I have been I'm amazed um, so evaluation this is a nice quote uh, from Rossi I'm sure you've uh, seen it many of you evaluation is a social science um, activity directed at collecting analyzing you know so measurement um, is part of evaluation, but measurement, just leaving the numbers there or the, or the uh, qual interviews there is uh, one step prior to analyzing, interpreting, assessing, which is what a, uh, evaluation is about, communicating information about the workings and effectiveness of social programs in this case. Um, so um, the world of evaluation clearly intersects with the world of measurement. In fact, I would often, uh, I would see them as being necessarily linked. And your evaluation framework, your research design should be in place before a program starts 100%. It, it has to be. And unfortunately, what we know, um, and, and many of you have been engaged with this, um, and uh, you recognize it, but it's difficult to get around, which is you're asked to evaluate um, or you decide to evaluate when your program is halfway through and you recognize that this is a terrible uh, problem, um, wish it didn't happen. And so as far as possible, uh, make sure your evaluation framework is there before your initiative starts and uh, that you're up and running before that. Um, now, so uh, 
in, in terms of um, evaluation, um, there's three areas, uh, and by the way, I've, I've, I have mentioned developmental evaluation um, as a way of doing evaluation. So um, I haven't actually put it in here, but um, something to, to follow up on later. But the three areas of evaluation that uh, I think are very important are what's called process evaluation. Um, and process evaluation is about how the initiative is delivered. Uh, was it well targeted, efficient in design, appropriately delivered? Um, and uh, this gets at the point that the impact of a program, the outcomes that you're trying to achieve in a program um, are affected by not only the structure of the program, but also the context in which you're working. And many people will recognize uh, when I say context and structure that uh, this lends itself to, a, to what's called a, a critical realist approach to evaluation. Um, that we don't just see the outcomes as being uh, linked just to the structure of the program itself. The program might be uh, really good, except that it turned out that you had resource constraints implementing, uh, you had some a bit of bad luck in the terms of um, the fact that a couple of people that were key people who you employed unfortunately had to move off for various reasons, uh, the thing was delayed, um, all sorts of things like that um, are critical uh, to um, the, the way that a program works. Now, here I'm not necessarily thinking about, you know, the, the broader confounding environmental uh, factors that impact on program outcomes. So, you know, right now, moving into high unemployment, um, we would think that a program that was delivering great employment services would be seeing worse employment outcomes than previously. Um, that's because of the environment. That's because of the confounding factor of the, the macro environment. So I'm not so much thinking about that, but I'm talking more about the actual delivery of the program itself. And that you can cover off on the process evaluation. Um, generally speaking, um, you, you either need very independent-minded people within your organization doing this process evaluation or very independently um, organized people from outside your organization doing it. Because uh, it does come up with, you know, things, a little bit of dirty linen comes up in this process evaluation process. And... Uh, we have to be very careful that we want to get the truth out without uh, obviously, um, you know, letting um, uh, issues of a confidential nature come out. So that's process evaluation. Impact evaluation is, for me, the key once we've done that process evaluation. Uh, and that should inform the impact evaluation. And that's all about program effectiveness. How effective was the initiative? Um, and then we get into um, economic evaluation, which is uh, done in a number of different ways, outcomes relative to costs, often called cost effectiveness analysis, uh, something that uh, we've done a lot on, which is cost offset kind of analysis, which is you deliver a program, it creates benefits, what kind of uh, costs have you saved because of the benefits you put in place, be very careful about this. Um, it is. It has got so many little issues connected to it, um, and often organisations and programs want magic numbers, such as <clears throat> this program um, cost this amount, but in the end we saved um, twice that, three times that, um, and the numbers are mean numbers. And um, uh, but often there's in small programs there are a lot of lot of issues with cost offset analysis. Uh, a little bit more dramatic is you measure benefits in terms of uh, dollars uh, relative to costs in terms of dollars, and then you've got rates of return um, and net present value numbers. Um, and uh, the simplified form of that is uh, social return on investment. 
Um, and we have seen a, a worldwide network develop uh, to do what is the virtually impossible, um, which is cost-benefit analysis of social programs. I regard it as virtually impossible. Um, but if we, if, you know, we, we can do it reasonably, uh, but we have to be very careful about that. And uh, social return on investment analysis can become a bit of a game as to, you know, making sure you get this very high number, which sometimes looks a little um, magical almost. Um, and so we have to be careful about the treatment of social return on investment analysis. Just in this um, impact evaluation, um, uh, the question of the counterfactual is, is pretty important. So what is the difference you're making <clears throat> relative to um, the alternative? What would have otherwise um, occurred? And um, so our interest is, did your program uh, really impact uh, could you have actually seen better outcomes without putting your program in place? Or more generally, relative to if what is called treatment as usual, a uh, horrible term, uh, I, I find, but relative to treatment as usual, did you get a uh, differential benefit? Very careful on this. So important to, that you get the counterfactual, but you also um, don't go overboard when you see your numbers because if treatment as usual is good treatment as usual <clears throat> and you've got other service providers doing a good job out there and you do an RCT, uh, don't get too worried about uh, the fact that you haven't got uh, you know, significant differential effects everywhere that you look because the other providers, treatment as usual, could be pretty good treatment um, and be glad about the good outcomes that you've got. Um, but to get at the question of differential impact, we uh, um, have to think about the um, counterfactual, um, and that's really very difficult. Um, so um, the two standards, of course, are the randomized control trial, where um, you, for example, you conduct uh, a process of getting those who are eligible. Obviously, ethics is critical. Um, they say, yes, I want to be part of this. They understand it perfectly. <clears throat> they do a baseline survey. Hopefully, you've also got consent around linked administrative data. Um, post uh, baseline survey, there's random allocation. Um, a lot of social programs and uh, social service workers do not uh, like an RCT design. Um, and then of course you follow the program group and the control group over time and look at differential outcomes. And if the sample size is large enough, and, and really the difficulty here is often very, very small sample sizes, then the two groups should be pretty equivalent. The alternative is a quasi-experimental design in which you don't have random allocation, but you do have pre uh, data, you have uh, data through the program and you have post data. And then you use statistical methods to control for confounding factors. Um, alternatively, um, you've got good pre post data. You've got a good kind of sounding board what it, with what is going on out there. Generally, you're intelligent about the use of your data. Uh, sometimes good time series data is really good. You know, here we had this positive change, nothing else we could see in the system that could have affected this. So don't be too concerned if you have the single group design. Uh, if you have got good pre, post, and you've got a good awareness of the reference point, um, and uh, it may not get you into the best of all possible journals if you're an academic, but it will be very, very strong evidence in the more practical setting, provided that you've got the reference point thought through and you've got pre post kind of data in place. Um, the last thing I want to mention before we have another QA um, is. Uh, a bit of a policy um, thing for us. Um, 
uh, we did this work uh, across Australia. Thanks to anyone who did uh, actually complete our wonderful survey. And uh, this was a survey about charities and, and um, outcomes measurement and evaluation in charities. And the key for us in this was that resources and barriers around capacity were really strong. Um, and you can see some numbers there that give you a bit of an idea about uh, the resource constraints felt. Proportion of budget spent on outcomes measurement, which is very low relative to say a standard of 10%. Um, and uh, something I don't show here, um, but we do have quite a lot of data when you have a look at it. If you go to the, the CSI website, you'll get our series on this. It was done with the Bank West Foundation, great work uh, from them. Uh, but virtually all of the, not all, it's a, a significant part of the funding that charities were receiving to do any measurement evaluation was not coming from program budgets was not being funded by their funders directly, but was being funded by internal resources, which of course sets up a, a real problem because um, those organizations that really have significant giving, have significant amounts of money coming in outside of direct program budgets, are uh, much more able to deliver the measurement and evaluation than others. Um, and it's really important that we recognize that there have been significant resource constraints and capacity restraints. Um, and the BankQuest Foundation um, essentially set this up because they were interested to know what the numbers were like in this area. So this is a big policy question for us. Um, now let's uh, uh, end that share. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. So we've had a really nice um, hour session. And we'll have just one or two questions. Um, and uh, I can see um, something from Paul. Um, Paul, do you want to actually, it's a, it's a good question, which is, for me, it's an important question, all about um, yeah, the truth of the matter, as opposed to the pressures and political pressures one faces in measurement and evaluation. So, Paul, maybe you can give the question or at least give a comment and we could perhaps, uh, rather than me uh, give an answer, uh, perhaps have any other comments from others. Yeah, happy to, Paul. As a, as a fellow economist, I guess we're trained to, uh, professionally trained to be cynical about things and to look at what people do more than what they say. So my question's really about you know, how explicit we should be in the evaluation about you know, what we know is going on you know, politically under the surface. Um, you know, there are advantages to making it explicit and there are perhaps some problems that come up by making that explicit. I'd be interested in, in your experience around that, Paul. Yeah, I mean, my experience is um, um, I've never um, had uh, a case with um, any um, not-for-profit organization that I've worked with in which I've had any finding suppressed or I have myself suppressed a finding, uh, which is interesting. Um, and that goes to findings which aren't perfectly in line with what the organization wanted to see. So, Certainly um, across our research, I would have probably had um, some, um, you know, not, I wouldn't describe these as pressures, but I would say, oh, you know, um, uh, we'd be interested to see, or we'd actually love you to see that you could show this result for our program and, uh, and off we go. Um, so I've actually myself not um, experienced that kind of, of suppression and uh, which is really interesting um, that um, we've been able to present our findings, but I do get the point um, and it can come through in different kinds of ways. So I, I have found that I have been able to deliver what I regard as the truth and being able to, within the resource constraints, um, deliver uh, what um, I can best do with the resource constraints that I have, but I haven't been suppressed in any way. Uh, that's not to say that suppression doesn't occur in more um, 
different in different ways and it can can occur because you're not given particular jobs or that uh, those who uh, get to uh, do measurement and evaluation may be if you like those who are um, uh, more in line if you like with uh, chosen outcomes that can occur obviously I get that very much but I've had a relatively good experience in that kind of an area but it's definitely uh, pressures definitely could be there I can understand that very much good thanks thanks for that um, Anne, Anne Lawless, um, there's a little comment uh, which may be worthwhile just um, exploring a little further um, about um, uh, approaches um, and different methodologies. And I think uh, that picked up with different people, Ellen, for example, around different paradigms. So maybe you might like to give a comment about that, Anne? Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi yes, I'm, I'm still here, Paul. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of um, internet problems. Um, no, I was just simply to point out that, and it's way beyond what we can hope to achieve today, and, and thank you for an excellent introduction, but it might interest people to know that there are um, some very systematic approaches that have already been defined to how to reconcile our quantitative and quantitative approaches. And it isn't just applied to the um, data treatment phase of research, but to all the phases of research. And as you dive into the mixed methods um, or mixed methodology literature, you get more and more sophisticated understandings of that as you read through the literature and, and also the projects to which it's been applied. So those methodologies or approaches are available. And um, just to reiterate, they apply to more than just the, the data treatment phase. They can be applied to every aspect of our research design. Yeah. And the great thing is the scholarship is already there because people have already thought it through and published, which is, you know, the wonderful part of being part of an intellectual community. Yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, um, in, in, in the few minutes remaining, um, if you do have a good reference that you'd like to uh, throw into the chat, area that people can follow through on um, do so whilst the chat is still open so um, you know we are facing a resource constraint of time and uh, throw that in um, in the last four or five minutes that you've got uh, available um, uh, in the chat and people can just co just copy off from chat the reference link if they want to follow through on that uh, maybe, um, Angela, you might be uh, uh, the last person to do a quick comment. Um, we don't have time for any more questions, but Angela Sedotti, do you want to just say something quickly and then... Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, it's more of a general comment and question, but I'm, I'm very interested in the role of the arts and culture in uh, social interventions and their effectiveness in dealing with complex social issues. I think it's such a difficult thing to measure and it also doesn't seem to have a lot of respect so what what would you say are the role is the role of this kind of academic space in lifting the sort of status of, of the arts and culture in being a really effective tool here yeah i mean i i um i have a bit of an interest but i i, I was never successful um I, I applied a number of or rather the csi uh, uwa applied a number of times to do some what we thought was going to be interesting work on the social impact of the arts and culture. And we, we thought through it um, in terms of, of research design. Um, and what was interesting was that um, the, the research design um, or the approach that we were taking um, didn't, um, didn't get through. Um, and so uh, in four or five attempts, I was never successful. So just to let everyone know, yeah, I mean, um, apply, apply, apply. Um, what was the Sam, Samuel Beckett? Fail, fail, better, fail again, fail. Anyway, he goes on to lots and lots of failures in uh, that uh, little quote. Um, and that's what my experience with the arts and culture was. It was failing every single time. Um, and I was disappointed because I really wanted to try out um, frameworks around really strong social impacts that occur in arts and culture. And we really wanted to put in a really strong design. I think that we were um, affected by 
groups that were doing more simple experiential um, count type of stuff in the arts and culture and weren't following through the deep social impact and human impact that arts and culture have in our lives. And uh, to me, it's always been a bit of a loss that, I, that we weren't able to do that. But I can tell you that um, in part, it, it may be um, a lack of, of spend on research and evaluation and uh, of long-term social impact um, and too much of a focus on uh, immediate experiential impact, which can now be done really easily by just clicking onto your phone and filling in a quick questionnaire as you're walking out the room, um, which I find um, great, but uh, uh, um, it would be good to really do the longer term social impact. So thanks for that right at the very end. Um, and I've just seen that the uh, Samuel Beckett quote uh, is there. Um, so uh, quickly download that before we finish because it's a classic of all time. Um, and let me just um, uh, see if I can get back to share screen to do one last plug uh, uh, before we end in one second, which is uh, that um, uh, we do have an outcomes measurement workshop program. And of course you can do our demonstrating social impact course and I would love to go back to face-to-face -to -face workshops uh, when stage three is fully implemented. But if not, we will do it uh, online. Um, but uh, I hope to see some of you face-to-face um, -face at some point in stage three uh, or after stage three. I'm, I'm not, I, haven't quick, I haven't really followed the um, press conference from today as well as I should have, but uh, we'll, we'll be getting there pretty soon, hopefully. Um, it's been a great time. Um, thanks everyone. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just let Nicola finish off for us all. Um, and, and it's been a really enjoyable hour and I hope you've enjoyed it too. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Paul. That was great, really informative. Uh, as, as mentioned in the chat, we'll be following up with the presentation and with the video uh, later. So you'll, you'll have more information coming to you. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Bye. Thank you.